Let me begin by thanking our terrific sponsors for making this evening's festivities possible. I'd like to thank Dr. Bob Shillman and the Shillman Foundation, the National Apartment Association, Latham and Watkins, George Rieger, JD, Chartered Investment Counselor, Rebecca Wood, Eric MacArthur, Gordon Todd, Will Levy, and the Sidley Austin Foundation, Hollingsworth, LLP, for sponsoring the cocktail reception that, that we just had. And last but not least, especially given my sweet tooth, uh, Greg Jacob, a partner at O'Melveny and Myers, for sponsoring the Sunset Desserts uh, later in the evening. And of course, everyone who purchased a ticket or made a donation, whether or not they could join us tonight, please join me in a round of applause for those sponsors and donors. And it is now my distinct privilege to introduce our special guest speaker, Secretary Mike Pompeo. There's, there's, there's more. Mike, Mike has already had a remarkable career, and I believe there could be much more to come. Details are in your program, like that he was first in his class at West Point, appointed by B1 Bob Dornan, for those who remember him. Uh, Mike graded on the Harvard Law Review. He headed Thayer Aerospace and Century International as CEO and served as a congressman from the 4th District of Kansas, where, uh, which is where I got to know him uh, and work with him. And of course, he most recently served as CIA Director and Secretary of State. But let me mention a couple of things about Mike uh, that you might not know. First, Mike drinks more Diet Coke than anyone I've ever met, <laughs> with the possible exception of NCLA's own John Vecchione. <laughs> it, it's a close race, I promise you that. More seriously, there was not a single congressman on Capitol Hill with more brain power than Mike. We are not often lucky enough to get public servants with his intellectual capacity, and I think the media woefully underreported under uh, this fact about Mike. In fact, when he was named Secretary of State, I got calls from every major news service, having been his chief of staff, asking for inside information or context about Mike. And I told them all the same thing but not a damn one of them printed what I said. <laughs> if John Kerry were half as smart as Mike Pompeo, they would have called him the next Henry Kissinger. <laughs> the other salient characteristic I'd like to share about Mike is that he's a straight shooter. People ask me why I think Mike gets along so well with his bosses. And they assume he must be a flatterer. I assure you he is not. Uh, or that he tells people what they want to hear. But the truth is nearly the opposite. And I saw this firsthand in Mike's relationship with Speaker John Boehner. Mike didn't always agree with Speaker Boehner, but he never lied to him. He never hid from him or refused to tell him how he was going to vote on something. He also didn't call him names behind his back. I saw and more often heard Mike tell Speaker Boehner, and donors for that matter, things that they did not want to hear. But Mike unfailingly and unflinchingly told Speaker Boehner what he was thinking, how he was going to vote, why he was going to vote that way, and so forth. Of course, it helped that Mike voted with leadership the vast majority of the time. <laughs> and always whenever leadership was supporting conservative ideas. That is, whenever he thought that they were trying to do something in the right direction that would be good for the country in the long run. So even if he disagreed with a tactic, he was willing to get behind things that were directionally right. If he thought that, uh, oh, and he never surprised leadership when it came to the whip count. In any event, I suspect that same candor and simple reliability went a long way with others as well. Finally, let me say that I, and consequently in CLA, Oh, Mike, a debt of gratitude. The skills I learned as his chief of staff with Mike as my daily management mentor for two and a half years, and he was not shy about giving me advice about how to manage the office, uh, had, a, have had a tremendous effect on the growth and success of NCLA over the past five years. So without further ado, please help me welcome to the podium one of the smartest, most straightforward, and most effective public servants you will ever meet, the 70th Secretary of State of the United States, Michael R. Pompeo. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it was Mark's bad fortune to be working at Coke Industries, coming to a political event when I was running for Congress, and then get tagged to be my chief of staff. <laughs> and as Mark says, I always tell the truth, but I said, Mark, I need you just for about six months, <laughs> which, which was, in fact, true. I did need him for six months, but yeah, I didn't tell him it was consecutive service terms for six months. <laughs> it's funny, you tell a story about Diet Coke. Um, I, I've told people all the time, they'll ask, what, what are you going to do next? Are you thinking about po further political service? And I tell them, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do anything. I, I love this country. It has been such a blessing to me. But you remember when in Georgia, 
uh, they had this issue on this voting bill, and everybody was saying, boycott Coke. I'm like, I can't do that. <laughs> like, anything for America, but i got to have my Diet Coke. <laughs> so, uh, Mark, thank you for those kind words. Uh, uh, I had the smartest chief of staff in town as well, and um, I appreciated that. We had good discussions. You were a powerful force for good conservative ideas on Capitol Hill. It was a blessing to me to have Mark as my chief of staff. I, I brought along other friends tonight. Actually, Mark brought them along. I have my... Uh, my co-conspirator, uh, when I was an uh, intern at Harvard Law School, Jennifer Bracera is here tonight. She and I combined made 15 bucks an hour, uh, and we thought we had struck gold working for Professor Marianne Glendon there. Um, I was thinking, too, Mark, as you told me tonight, that you said, Mike, you have 20 minutes, and you have to take down the administrative state. <laughs> uh, I can't take down the administrative state in 20 years, probably. Um, but I, I did take administrative law at Harvard Law School. My professor was a man named Christopher Edley. Uh, Christopher Edley couldn't pick me out of a lineup, although he probably today wishes I was in a lineup somewhere. <laughs> um, and our guest professor was then First Circuit Judge uh, Stephen Breyer. Um, neither of them thought the same things that I think about the administrative state or that you think. And the set of experiences I had these last four years only confirmed what uh, I believed then. Uh, oh, by the way, frankly, after, even after the semester course, I still didn't understand the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, I was sworn tonight not to mention Chevron, so there it is. Uh, but I want to say thank you to you all for this important mission. I'll close tonight by talking about why your work matters. Uh, but know that the work you're doing to push back against uh, the tyranny of the administrative state matters an awful lot and to those of us who have chosen to serve. Um, we see it, we experience it, we suffer from it. And citizens all across America who aren't serving in government see it, experience, and suffer from it as well. Congrats for getting cert on a case that you're working on. I think that's fantastic. Uh, two, I heard people saying as I was getting ready to come here, this organization really isn't very bipartisan. I checked. You served the Trump administration about 15 times. <laughs> but not State Department of CIA. <laughs> uh, I was thinking I was uh, driving in tonight. I wish the CIA had rulemaking authority. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it for a second. Uh, it, it, actually, I'm glad that it doesn't. It would be as disturbing as your minds are wandering off to now. Uh, no, the, the truth is, um, we, all, we all know where the nation has gone to in respect to denying basic rights through a tyranny of a un set of unelected officials. I saw it as a member of Congress in so many ways. Uh, Mark would remember my, uh, my, my moments. My wife always says, make sure when you're trying to take someone down, you do it with a smile. And I would go to these committee hearings, and I would do that for the most part. But then this woman named Gina McCarthy, who was the head of the EPA, would show up, and I just couldn't manage it. Um, don't look it up on YouTube. They're my least proud moments. But they were redefining the things that mattered to the citizens of the 4th District of Kansas in ways that Congress never intended, the thing that you all are working so hard against. Uh, in my first couple of years, we were working on something called Waters of the U.S., right, a fundamental abrogation of the central idea of Congress being able to decide what a waterway is. And it really mattered a lot to the people that I was representing, a largely agriculture community, but also big manufacturers who depended on affordable water in home state, our home state of Kansas as well. And then they had moved on uh, to redefining pollutant, right, and another set of regulations having to do with uh, greenhouse gases. These are the ideas that undermine America when Congress passes rules and courts just simply bow down to administrative agencies. It undermines the very foundations of what it is we do. There's probably nothing more clear today that we're seeing, place that we're seeing this happen than respect to Title IX. Uh, I remember being at Camp David with uh, Secretary DeVos when she was working trying to put it back in the box to put it in a better place. And uh, little did we know that it was in a better place <laughs> than it is today. They are, they are truly undermining the things that matter most to me and to my family. And they're doing so in a way that is deeply inconsistent with any reasonable understanding of the statutory authority that they have. Uh, they, are, they are going to make a mess. Mostly, frankly, for women. They're mostly going to under, uh, undermine the basic rights, the basic protections that have been afforded to women as a result of Title IX for so long. And by redefining this and putting gender in place of the language that's actually in the statute, I am very confident that uh, uh, my son's fiance, Rachel, I pray that we will have grandchildren, and I pray that we will get back in charge and be able to fix 
what they're undermining in Title IX, so that uh, if I happen to have a granddaughter, she will live in a world that is safe and secure and not threatened by a very statute that was aimed at actually protecting and preserving opportunities for her. Uh, you know, Mark and I... Mark and I worked on something that none of you have ever heard of. It's called the Economic Development Administration. It's small in the scheme of Washington, but it is a slush fund for uh, administrative agencies. It's just essentially an Economic Development Association. What is that, you're all asking? They just take money and throw it around to congressmen that they prefer. We decided we were going to get rid of it. So Mark and I toiled away, and my, my chief of staff that was Mark's uh, number two, Jim Richardson's here with me tonight. Jim uh, followed this story, too. What I saw there was politically frightening. Uh, I survived it. I was in the 4th District, Kansas. Uh, I could get reelected. But when I came after the agency, when I said, you know, I just think this, this should be budgeted out. We went over. We met with them. We were honest and open about why we thought they were useless or worse. <laughs> and uh, they ran ads in my district. They went to Wichita State University, the largest university in the district that I represented, and gave money to Wichita State and then held press conference aiming to make it look like I was foolish, that what I was doing wasn't truly benefiting the people in my own district. They were doing precisely what it is we are afraid administrative agencies will do. They will use their money and resources to create power for themselves to the detriment of the political actors that are actually responsible for governing this nation. Um, I survived it. Sadly, so did they. They are still around today. I meant to check on the way in here, but I'm confident they are spending more money uh, and they were doing it in a more dilatorious way to the United States of America than even when I was there. I regret that this was one of my failures of my time in service. And I'd spend a couple minutes talking about what President Trump called the deep state. He had other names for it, too. I won't repeat them tonight. <laughs> uh, you, you talked about how I survived. I, I do. It, it is a bit of a marvel. Five secretaries of defense, four national security advisors, just me. Uh, <laughs> I, I won't give away all the secrets, but uh, it was about listening, and it was about understanding commander's intent, and it was my deep understanding that the Constitution appointed an executive to be in charge, and that I'd gotten precisely zero electoral votes. Uh, by the way, he reminded me of that with some frequency, <laughs> <laughs> and told me the exact number that he received. <laughs> But I, I watched, uh, even in, in my world, in the State Department, um, I watched actors there uh, protected by the administrative state. There are three unions at the State Department. On top of the uh, collective bargaining agreements themselves, there are the civil service statutes that made it incredibly difficult for me to actually direct senior officials inside my own organization. I can't tell you the countless stories, although if my book ever gets published, you'll see a few. Uh, the countless stories of people who were actively working to undermine exactly what it was President Trump wanted us to achieve. And worse, in many cases, they were working in a way that was active but sub rosa, in a way that I couldn't see or feel, that was truly denying the American people what it is that they deserve, the policies that the commander-in-chief chooses. I, I say this in complete sincerity. Today, they should be doing precisely what it is President Biden wants them to do. I mean that with all of my heart. Um, I think America will be worse off if they are successful at doing that, but it's their responsibility. And for four years, uh, I watched. Less at my first leadership post at CIA, much more obviously and patently at the State Department. And the capacity for a Secretary of State to control that depends on his capacity to get his own team on the field, to get sufficient political leadership inside of his organization. But with 70,000 people, only a handful of hundreds of which actually absorb the agenda that the commander-in-chief is destined to put before the American people and to continue to have to defend, um, it was truly tragic and a-constitutional. And I have a theory of the case on how one might attack this problem set, and I pray that me or someone like me will get a chance to take that on. And will do it with seriousness, at enormous cost to their own political capital, when there are many bigger fish to fry in the world. I understand precisely why Republican presidents come in with the intention of taking down the administrative state and those actors who are there undermining them. Things get in the way. The real world intervenes. But I can't imagine a better eight-year project. I can't imagine an undertaking that could transform America back to the place of our founding, back to its central constitutional understandings that says 
that those who serve actually serve those who are elected. And that leads me to my closing idea. You all came here tonight to work on something that most Americans don't think about very often. In their daily lives, they spend very little time thinking about the administrative state and how it impacts their lives. But if you pressed them, if you presented it to them, if you told them what was actually taking place, they would know that they feel it, that it does actually affect them and their children and their schools and their district attorneys and all of those things and the due process rights of their boys at school and the protection and security for their women who are their children, their female children who are in school. By the way, you should know I think I just covered all the genders. <laughs> if I missed one, somebody let me know. Um, I don't, I'm probably on my way out as I'm walking down Black Lives Matter Plaza. Uh, the truth is I believe deeply in our founding documents. And it is an administrative state that is fundamentally at odds with those founding documents. I, I worked on a project, uh, Peter Berkowitz is here tonight, um, he, he led the effort for me at the State Department. We worked on a project that we ended up calling the Unalienable Rights Commission. But if you unpack that, it was my effort to try and draw my team at the State Department. When they went around the world talking about human rights, as America understands human rights, that they would be talking about a way that our founders might plausibly understand. I watched the cables emanate from the State Department all across the world when I took over. We were roughly 18 months into the four years of President Trump. And I watched, and I watched them talk about human rights in language that none of us would truly appreciate or understand. And I wanted to try and draw it back in. And the central thesis was that these founding documents were right, and they were decent, and they were moral, and they were something that everyone in the world could understand and appreciate, and that if my diplomats would go around the world and speak to those rights, the fundamental founding ideas then not only would we be doing our duty, our job, but we would make those places better too. They might well have different traditions, they might have different understandings, but they would come to understand that this noble nation, this exceptional place, still knew who it was. We, um, we think about our rights as not coming from any government, not our federal government, not our state government, but from what the good Lord created. But it is also deeply buried inside our founding documents that the process issues around continuing to protect and preserve those three articles, due process rights, all of the things that are in those documents matter an awful lot. I know today some on the right are frustrated by the way this has unfolded. Believe, sign me up. But we have to get back to these ideas. There, there, is, there is no more important idea. We do not want to Shanghai the governmental process for the benefit of the ideas that we believe are right. I, I must say, we will lose that fight. They like government. They enjoy being there. They spend their lives thinking that if they can manipulate the levers of power inside our federal government, then they can, in fact, achieve the things that they want to achieve. And they are deeply at odds with your understanding of how the administrative state should behave and how individuals must behave. But more importantly, they're at odds with how government must behave. If we lose the central thesis that the authority that we have, whether you're a backbench member of Congress from South Central Kansas, or you're fourth in line for the presidency of the Secretary of State, or in fact you are the president, if we lose the central thesis that this is a government that is only by the consent of its people, then we will have lost the central arc that made this country so special for 250 years. Close with the idea that you should know I'm long America. I know, I know it gets exhausting. I know we watch what's taking place today. I must say it's been a long 20 months for me too. Um, but I'm confident. I'm confident that Churchill was right, that America, America always gets it right after we exhaust all the other possibilities. I can see that we may well be close to hitting the predicate for that central idea too, but that we will get it right. And we will get it right because people like you come out on the evening to gather around an idea, an idea that our government matters, the way our government behave matters, and that our government is a government of limited powers, and it is a government that should be served by people who understand those limited powers and observe them in their daily activities. Bless you for the work that you do. Thank you all for being here tonight. I pray that the good Lord will bless this organization and bless this great country. Thank you all so very much for having me.
We have we have two uh, tokens of our appreciation for for your coming, Secretary Pompeo. First, this is a this is a bust of George Washington. I think uh, appropriate, uh, get, both given where where we're gathered and, and given his remarks about uh, entanglements with foreign alliances and so forth. Uh, and uh, uh, it's also uh, later on this evening we're going to have the Georgies. These are these are the positive awards that we're uh, that, that we're that we're giving out to people. Uh, and then uh, we also have the this will uh, the King George the Third Award will be given out later this evening. And uh, I won't reveal I won't reveal who's getting that uh, just yet. Uh, but we also have something uh, more practical uh, for you as well. But thank you, thank you so much. This reminds me of when, long, long ago, I taught at my home state's law school, University of Connecticut, a wonderful place. We had just moved into the old seminary building, this is the Hartford Seminary, and so it was not configured quite for your ordinary law school. Um, at times, I taught in the chapel, I would teach from behind the altar, and when reading the statute, would climb up into the um, pulpit to read the black letter text. Um, and in another room where I taught corporate law in the evenings, imagine three hours of corporate law with me. Um, it was an L-shaped room, and this reminded me of that. I had not remembered it for at least a decade or so. But here I am back again at University of Connecticut, and it was quite wonderful because one is taught, as a law teacher, to have eye contact with everyone in the room moving around. But of course, in an L-shaped room, that means panning back and forth like this. And the beauty of it is when someone in the far end of one section of the room wants to have a conversation about disputed questions, let's say insider trading, with someone in the far end of the other part, there's a certain translation that has to take place because they can't hear each other. In any case, um, it's wonderful to be back at the University of Connecticut. Uh, <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for being here. It's really amazing to be here with all of you, and we're deeply honored by your company. I cannot begin to express how astonishing this is for me to be here, to see all of you, to eat this delicious food in this beautiful place. It's nothing I ever imagined. I, when, I, when we started the NCLA, my vision of a gala was to sit around with some rather bitter lawyers drinking rather bitter <laughs> drinks of really bad scotch. And that's my, that was my idea of a, of, of a gala. And so this is really unnerves me in a way. The administrative state is a strange beast. It's often thought to be a structural problem, and that's true enough. But it's much worse than that. It's a threat to our civil liberties. It's the greatest threat to our civil liberties in our era. It destroys our rights of elective self-government. We thought we elect the people who make our laws. Boy, is that silly. That's not the way it works. It denies our procedural rights. Jury rights, due process rights, concentration rights, you can just go on the whole list. It just eviscerates the Bill of Rights. It takes a knife to it, like just says, you've got a fish. It guts the procedural rights. It even threatens our substantive rights of free speech and religion. It's a wonderfully effective way of destroying speech rights and freedom of religion. It thus is, quite systematically, the most sweeping threat to our constitutional rights that we have. Now, this is just one tiny little insight, but I think it goes a long way in clarifying why we must fight this beast. There are many people in this town who think that you can invite the administrative state to sit down with you at a dinner at a nice place like this. And you say to the administrative state, it's okay, we understand you're hungry, but we'll split the food, right? And the beast smiles. You say, good, we're glad we're in agreement on that. But by the time the dinner is over, it actually not only ate its half, it ate all of your food too. In fact, it ate you. <laughs> There's no room for compromise on that. But rather than discuss the administrative state tonight, I want to focus on the new Civil Liberties Alliance. It is the only organization devoted entirely to litigating against the administrative state. It is the only organization that views this as a fight for civil liberties. It is the only organization with a real depth of expertise in the field, and it already has had a profound impact. Why? I think it's because it's engaged in a new type 
of litigation against administrative power. This is not your standard litigation against the administrative state. It's not in defense of particular industries. The standard old-style litigation was, oh, coal is under attack. Everyone rally around and defend coal, and you spend a million dollars from the most expensive lawyer in town to defend coal, and you lose and create precedent against yourself. Whoopee. That's not the way to do it. It's not against particular agencies. I know there are some agencies out there that richly deserve one's attention. We've found a few of those. Right, Peggy? The SEC, for example. But that's because they volunteer. Um, <laughs> we have no animus against them. And I'm serious about that. Our, our, one of our mottos is um, to uh, hate the sin, love the, uh, love the sinner. It's not that we really love the agencies, but we do our best to love everyone in them. They're just misguided. And we have to, instead of hurting them, we just want to give them a great big hug and break their toys. Um, <laughs> the, we're not aimed against to defend particular industries, nor are we aimed to attack particular agencies. It's the last thing we want to do. That's a way of wasting money and time. The goal is to go against the types of power that cut across agencies. If you can go against the types of power, you don't have to sue each agency, and you don't have to defend each individual. Ten years ago, who would have imagined that administrative power was still an open question? It was settled. In a little bit of vanity, forgive me, I like to think that my 2014 book changed that. But it's not just a book that makes a difference. But even five years ago, who would have thought the Supreme Court might reconsider delegation, might reconsider deference, might reconsider the denial of jury rights, not to mention a host of other administrative horrors? All of those are now on the table. Not fully decided, but not entirely undecided either. Chevron, for example, is the walking dead, right? It's not, we don't have a coroner certificate at the Supreme Court, but lower courts know that you want to walk around this dead body. And I'm glad to say the NCLA has changed all of this. The NCLA has put these questions on the table. So I want to explain how the NCLA was founded. How did something so improbable come to play into place? First, let's just admit it, money. Uh, you know, uh, I'm just an academic, an ill-dressed academic usually, um, in uh, New York. But occasionally, notwithstanding my sartorial failures, I'd be invited to parties downtown. And I would go occasionally, that's before I had kids, um, I would go <laughs> to these parties and events, and I'd say things that no doubt it sounded foolish. I'd say, hey, you know, we need a new civil rights organization to fight administrative power. And people would look at you as if you're crazy. They'd smile, it's an academic, or they just walk away. <laughs> but one day, you know, you go to these again and again and again, and you say the same silly thing, and soon you realize perhaps one should not say these things. But then one day I got a different reaction. After I spoke about this for only about 30 seconds, a very nice man said, that's interesting, I can give you $75,000 for that. <laughs> Whoa, okay, great. Um, now that doesn't do much, 75000 but the point was to help you get started. And indeed, shortly afterwards, another gentleman, very nice, very nice, this is all individuals who just happened to care about this stuff, offered to give more, much, much more, and we were up and running. And then foundations started to give. And some of the people who did some of this giving are in this room, so thank you. Um, foundations started to give, and suddenly we're in business. There was a pot of money, or potential money, and we had to do something. Of course, as an academic, I'd never done anything in my life. Right? <laughs> those who can do, those who can't teach. And there it was, beginning to wonder, whoops, now I've got to do something with it. Um, and then I realized the key was actually not just money, but people, personnel, the right people. So the second thing I want to talk about is our students. Some wonderful students have made an enormous contribution to this organization. Some Yale students were involved, including one, Brian Richmond. Raise your hand, please, so people know who you are. Brian Richmond and Janie, what's her last name now? Popper. Janie Popper. She's a new last name. Uh, she can't be here, but Brian and Janie sat down to lunch with me in New Haven after an event, and they said, we're going to hold a class on administrative law, and they had 30 students studying it. And 
once students get involved, what's interesting is the foundations who are interested perhaps more than should be in education, foundations began to think, oh, right, this thing has legs. That was very important. And Brian has been a stalwart supporter, so thank you. And then some Columbia students got involved. Um, they're off clerking and making money, so they can't be here today. But some Columbia students have been crucial and continue to be, by the way. There's an increasing network among students across the country, which is marvelous, profound. So students often contribute more than they know. And then third, there's this pesky question of who runs the thing, because of course, I don't know how to run an organization. I'm just an academic. Um, and, and just to make you, I, I don't want to make this confessional, but just so you understand how improbable this is, you know, I don't study contemporary law. I'm an historian. I talk to the dead. Now, I'm not schizophrenic. They don't talk back. But um, I talk to the dead. And until, that is at least until five years ago. And so I have no idea how to deal with real people. Uh, so suddenly I had this intense need for a director. But for a whole summer, I read resumes. One came in after another. Um, and I became increasingly despondent. Many resumes, by the way, were superb. Some came from very distinguished, even famous lawyers. I was honored they applied, but none of them were quite right. At the end of the summer, I was about to give up. Mark Chenoweth's resume arrived. I just took one look at it and said, that's it. I told my wife, it's done. She said, have you talked to him? No, no, this is it. In any case, I talked to him. That slowed things down, of course. Um, <laughs> I should have just hired him when I saw the resume. Um, in any case, Mark is an astonishing individual. He's done a wonderful job in jump-starting a new organization. And he's been so successful that in recognition of his talents, the board of directors just recently elevated him to president of the NCLA. So thank you, Mark. By the way, we just had Pompeo here. Mark was his chief of staff. If Pompeo wins the presidency, do we lose Mark? So vote against Pompeo. <laughs> just kidding. So fourth, we also need, it's not just a director, we need lawyers. And our litigators are the very heart of the organization. They are truffle hounds for smelling out good cases. And I love that. Um, some just can, they can smell a case from 100 miles away, and they'll go after it and seize upon it, and that's wonderful. They work seamlessly up from pretrial work to trials and up to appeals all the way to the Supreme Court. So I might just must say I'm immensely proud of our litigators and deeply grateful to them. And I should say also to all the rest of our staff um, who are just wonderful, including in organizing this lovely event. And then... Fifth, there are clients. Um, I can't single them all out tonight. I simply want to say thank you to all of our clients. Um, you have stood up for our constitutional freedoms, and I know that can be difficult, because actually you're the ones who have to pay a price if things don't work out. It may even be difficult when they do work out. Without you, we'd make no progress against the Ministry of State. We have some clients here. Would you be kind enough to stand up for a round of applause? Please. And then six, there are allies and supporters, namely all of you. Thank you for your contributions. The fight against the administrative state is not just about organization. It has to be a movement. And that's why we're called an alliance. And we're privileged to be allied with each and every one of you in defense of our civil liberties. We are going to take our Constitution and put it back in the courts. It isn't in the courts at the moment. Precedent is in the court. But we want the constitutions back in the court. Constitution back in the court, and you are each of you contributing to that. Thank you. Now, we're going to win this fight, as is already evident from this last uh, few months. We're doing very well, and it's wonderful. But I want to close by disclosing to you a new development. It's a secret weapon. The Pentagon has lasers and other neat toys, perhaps soon some hypersonic missiles. We have our equivalent, and it's important for you to know about it. So I'm going to reveal it to you. This is our special weapon <laughs> against administrative power. It is the deference doll, we call it in-house. In front it says, doing the deference. And 
This can help folks understand things, something called deference, right? With a gentle push, you get, whoops, there we go, need skid more deference, right? With a slightly harder push, you get our Kaiser deference. With a full push, you get Chevron deference. <laughs> and every judge should have this on his desk or her desk to understand this. And of course, we can make it bend over backwards for brand X deference. <laughs> this is going to win the fight for us. Any case, thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank As I was riding in, I see this, this wonderful, wonderful obelisk. It has the look of a monument. Why, why yes, it's a monument to a, to a famous George. Oh, how delightful! The colonists must really have loved their king to erect such a tribute. Uh, not exactly. If it's not a monument to me, then to whom is it a monument, pray tell? George Washington, the father of our country. Oh, rude! <laughs> Actually, we do have an award that is named for you, though. It's, uh, it's inspired by you, and we're going to give it, uh, to the worst abuser of civil liberties in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, is this the award? This here? is the award here, yes. Yeah. All right. Do you favor the likeness? It's, uh, my nose is a little snooty looking, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Some might say that little critter is mad. Well you, well, you might think that no one could deserve this award more than you, but in a year marked by countless unconstitutional administrative abuses in the name of public health, there is someone who deserves it more. But before I reveal who that is, there are four nominees who made it to the flagrant four this year, and if, and if you are not... If you are not uh, following the, uh, the King George III tournament, then I invite you next year to pay attention right around the 1st of March when we'll be rolling out the third annual King George III uh, award uh, yeah, bra yeah. bracket. And uh, I, I, usually there are 32 nominees, and you can, you can vote your favorites along every couple of weeks. Uh, uh, you know, I was paying a lot of attention to the bracket that ended in the University of Kansas winning the national championship this year, but the King George III bracket is actually much more important because it allows us... I have us to go there. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it's more important because it allows us to draw attention to all, or at least a, a large number of very deserving bureaucrats who need to have a program heaped upon them. So that's what the bracket's about. It gives opportunity to do that. And then... Like I say, we have the flagrant four that uh, that have that have made it uh, made it this far. So, uh, who are the flagrant four? Rick Spinrad of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, who abused small fishermen in New England so badly that Hollywood made his agency the villains in a Best Picture Oscar-winning movie. The second of the flagrant four is Gary Gensler from the Securities and Exchange Commission, who did uh, more than enough to win the prize in any other year, approving NASDAQ's flatly illegal board diversity quota scheme, for starters. And we could easily have given the CDC a repeat victory. That's who won it last year, if you, uh, if you remember. Uh, since uh, Rochelle Walensky not only extended uh, the unconstitutional eviction moratorium, but also did her part uh, to pretend that natural immunity isn't a real thing. But these infractions, egregious though they are, pale in comparison to this year's winner. This year's winner fancied himself a monarch with unlimited and unchecked prerogative. And so we commissioned a special trophy just for this year's winner. I invite you all to come up and, and take a look at it uh, later. And in a year when myriad agencies claimed to be following the science, even as they ignored any data that conflicted with their narrative, one stethoscope-wearing bureaucrat led the charge. In a year when public health officials openly lied to the American people for fear they could not handle the truth, one man had the temerity to claim, attacks on me, quite frankly, are attacks on science. So, this year's winner of the King George III Prize for Worst Abuser of Civil Liberties is none other than Anthony Fauci. Oh. 
Now, we, we also have some, uh, some positive awards to bestow. Anthony Fauci couldn't be with us this evening to uh, receive this award. I'm not sure he was invited, to be completely candid with you. Uh, but uh, but we, do have some, we do have some positive contributions to the fight against uh, the administrative state. And what I would, what I would ask is, is for the winners uh, to come up, accept your prize, and, then, and stay up here. We'll get, a, we'll get a picture with all the winners and the two Georges, uh, and then we'll let everybody uh, have, their, uh, have their dessert. May I ask? Yes. May I ask you, this Mr. Fauci that you mentioned? Yes. Was he at Lexington in Concord? I don't believe so. Because I understand that he's the one that heard the shots heard around the world. Oh, oh that's a wild grounder, isn't it? Please. Well, appropriately, the uh, the very first and, and you saw us, you saw the the it's, a, it's the same bus we gave to uh, to Secretary Pompeo earlier. But the very first George Washington Award goes appropriately to NCLA's first client, a man who has persevered against the administrative state all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and then some. His story is in your program, but that account really does not sufficiently explain the gauntlet that this NCLA client had to run to achieve some measure of justice from the SEC. So the recipient of the 2022 New Civil Liberties Alliance Award for Client Bravery, which we're calling the Georgie, is Raymond L. Lucia Sr. recipient is a law firm that has provided more pro bono service in more matters to NCLA's clients than any other, including a cert petition to the U.S. Supreme Court in Gibson v. SEC involving the same issue as the Cochran case that's now at the, at the Supreme Court, another cert petition to the U.S. Supreme Court in Buffington v. McDonough that is still pending. Knock, I, knock on wood, but I've got, I've got uh, plexiglass up here. <laughs> Uh, and that has to do with whether the pro-veteran candidate of construction trumps Chevron deference. And most recently, they helped us negotiate NCLA's first case at the U.S. Supreme Court, crafting our response to the petition for cert in Cochrane v. SEC, and masterfully steering that case to likely be argued alongside Axon v. FTC, which will decide whether people like Ray Lucia, Christopher Gibson, and Michelle Cochran have to endure an administrative proceeding before raising constitutional challenges to unlawful administrative tribunals. Numerous attorneys at Latham and Watkins have contributed to these efforts, but I'd like to particularly single out and call up Greg Gar and Roman Martinez, who have, Roman Martinez, who have led these efforts. The recipient of the 2022 NCLA Award for Outstanding Pro Bono Service is Latham and Watkins, LLP. <laughs> I hope they like the, like these because General Cornwallis had orders to bring one of these back to King George, except it wasn't a, wasn't one of these. It was the actual thing. <laughs> Never did show up. What, I heard that uh, Abraham Abraham Lincoln liked to tell a story about you, and I, you probably don't know who uh, who President Lincoln is, but uh, he, uh, he he told he told the story of uh, of, a, of a gentleman who uh, went to London and uh, visited the privy, and there was a picture of you over the privy, and this uh, and this American was was asked what he thought when he came back to the dinner table about this picture of you over the privy, and he said, well, I think it's very appropriate. And they said, well, what do you mean? I mean, this is, this, this, how can that be? And he said, well, I can't think of anything that would scare the crap out of the British faster than the sight of George Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Huzzah! <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> our next award recipient is a law firm that provided more pro bono service to NCLA and our client last year than any other on a very short timeline. When our case had been, uh, 
when our case, which had been taken on bonk by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, was dismissed as improvidently granted, one member of NCLA's Board of Advisors stepped forward and volunteered to lead the effort for a cert petition to the U.S. Supreme Court in a Oposhian v. Garland, our case against ATF over its unlawful bump stock regulation. That one is also still pending after being rescheduled for conference 18 times so far, I believe. We're going to have to figure out if that's a record, but uh, we're going to look into that. And on a personal note, though this is not a part of the criteria for the award, I would like to say, in addition to his firm's excellent work, Chuck Cooper has been a model member of our Board of Advisors, providing me trusted counsel on matters both sensitive and significant. And so the recipient of the 2021 New Civil Liberties Alliance Award for Outstanding Pro Bono Service is Cooper and Kirk, PLLC. Thanks, Chuck. Three to one, now the odds are about right. <laughs> <laughs> That brings us to the New Civil Liberties Alliance Ally Award for Best Amicus Curiae Brief. The, this amicus brief was filed by another member of our Board of Advisors at a time when the outcome of our Cochrane v. SEC case was still very much in doubt, and we were trying to obtain rehearing on Bonk from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Allison Ho and her colleagues at Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher provided an outstanding brief that I'm confident helped to turn around the results in that case. So thanks to Allison, Jacob Spencer, Ashley Johnson, Bradley Hubbard, Brian Clegg, and Joseph Barakat, the winners of the best amicus curiae brief, and here to accept the award on behalf of his Gibson Dunn colleagues is Board of Advisor member Brian Richmond. Yeah, yeah. Now you stand a chance, George. I'm also pleased to announce the winner of our inaugural student note competition awarded for the best note written by a student on a theme chosen by NCLA. This year's theme was executive abuse as a response to the pandemic. This year's winner is Avi Weiss, a student at Columbia Law School, for his note published in the Columbia Law Review entitled Binding the Bound, State Executive Emergency Powers and Democratic Legitimacy in the Pandemic. Avi's note really struck a chord with our judges because it describes succinctly the illegality and illegitimacy that led NCLA to sue so many power-mad governors over the last two years. This one is extra special because in addition to the bust, he and the Columbia Law Review that published his note will split a $10,000 prize. And finally, I would like to acknowledge a pair of attorneys who have helped NCLA in numerous ways. They have mooted our attorneys for oral argument, provided amicus briefs, provided local counsel, helped secure clients, strategized with us, cheered our successes, flown to our oral arguments on their own dime to provide moral support, and much, much more. These two attorneys transcend the meaning of counselor and are true friends in the law to NCLA and our team which is one of the reasons we were so thrilled at their tremendous recent success at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit in the U.S. v. Jarkissi decision. This is the one you may have heard about this past month that supposedly threatens the entirety of the administrative state. Let's hope so. <laughs> As if the administrative state could no longer survive if people had jury rights, or if administrative law judges were not insulated from removal, or if Congress had to abide by the vesting clause of Article I. But we were planning to honor them quite apart from this glorious victory. And so we were delighted to give the inaugural Cincinnatus Award for selfless service to the new Civil Liberties Alliance to Karen Cook and Michael McCulloch. You know, I, I, I had a toast, and I've sort of forgotten it, um, but it's very simple, really. Um, the formal one I'm going to put aside. Uh, but to our Constitution, 
to the NCLA, to the restoration of our constitutional liberties, and to all of you in the new movement for our civil liberties. Thank you. Cheers. Here, 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 here.